Well, hello there. Thanks for joining me. This is Marketing in the Raw. That's the podcast. And my name's Adam Helloway. I'm the host. Are you a parent? Or maybe you know a parent like this. You ever met somebody that no matter how ornery their child is, that parent just doesn't want to hear at all about any mistake that child made or anything that that child could be possibly doing that would communicate anything other than that kid being perfect? Well, I know how that feels. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a first-time father with a four-year-old kid. I get it. I totally, totally get it. You've invested so much of your time, so much of your heart into this child. And even before having that child, you, you imagine in your head what you're going to do and how awesome this child is going to be because of that investment that you know that you're willing to put into it. Well, founders have the same issue in starting businesses. They end up starting those businesses, investing so much time and energy into it. And that doesn't even count all of the time spent dreaming and planning before creating that business. And when they create that business, they don't often think about what it'll take to actually bring customers to the business, to, to generate revenue, to do the thing that helps that business survive and grow and thrive. That's where today's guest comes in. I'm talking to one of my great friends, Todd Wilms. He's the founder of foundersplace.co, and he's the author of Beyond Product, How Exceptional Founders Embrace Marketing to Create and Capture Value for Their Businesses. Now, uh, we're going to talk about it from the founder's perspective, but we are also going to talk about it from the marketer's perspective because marketers play a significant role in communicating the value of marketing and helping to grow those businesses that those founders have started. Todd and I talk about how founders might reframe how they perceive marketing at all stages of their business and how marketers would be able to bridge the gap and work better with those founders on executing marketing on behalf of their companies. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. Here's Todd Wilms. Good afternoon. No, it's not even afternoon yet. How are you doing, Todd? It's, I'm doing great. What, whatever time it is and whatever time it is, wherever you're listening, I'm doing great. How are you doing, Adam? Um, I'm doing all right now that I'm here talking to you. Uh, I appreciate you making the time. Uh, you know, we've sat down and talked multiple times over the last, I don't know how many months, uh, uh, right around just before you were going to launch this this book that we're going to talk a little bit about here. Um and, and I got to say, I, 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 I love the topic. Uh, I've started diving into it a bit and I love what you're saying in there. Um, can you just tell folks really quickly about what the title of the book is and why did you feel that this book even needed to be written in the first place? Sure. Yeah. So perfect. Well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start off because I think this is a really good question and something I'm really kind of excited about. And, and it's interesting because I find a lot of authors are like promoting their book all the time. And now that I've got one, I'm doing the same thing, but it's not because I'm trying to sell books. It's because I'm excited about this as a topic. It's why I wrote about it. So the title of the book is called Beyond Product. And it's really focused on helping founders, entrepreneurs, and even big dreamers become better at what they do. So whether you're in a company and you're in an incubator and you're an entrepreneur, you're in a garage and you're starting your own thing, or you're the next unicorn here in Silicon Valley, everyone has this compulsion, this really big idea, this something that they've got to do. And what I found is after working with a lot of these founders and dreamers and entrepreneurs and inventors and people that have this passion for something, that there's gaps, that we can't be everything to everybody. The way I equate this is if you're a marketer, you've got a swim lane. If you're a CFO, you've got a financial swim lane. If you're an operations person, you've got an operations swim lane. If you're a CEO at a startup, you're in everybody's swim lane and you can't be everything to everybody. And so founders need help just like anybody else. And so I looked at it and said, how can I help founders be better founders, wherever they are and whatever they're doing? And so this book is dedicated to helping them from, I have this great idea at a Starbucks or whatever coffee shop you like, right? Little diner down the street. I have this great idea 
all the way till I build something and then there's an exit. And maybe that, that exit is failure, maybe it's wild success, maybe it's going off and doing something else or rinse and repeat and doing the same thing. But that whole journey has needs someone to help them along through that path. And so I wrote this book as a dedication to them to help them through that entire journey. How do you take that great idea, make it beyond just the product and take it into market? You know, and also a lot of authors who write books just sort of write books. They, they write books off of their, their feelings, their thoughts. Not all of them, I think, in my opinion, did the, the digging and the research that you did. I mean, I want you to share a little bit about um, what went into the, the, the research you did. Yeah, well, in, in addition to, you know, having a, a discipline in, in marketing, I sat down and really looked at it and went, okay, this can either be just a passion project of Todd's point of view, or I can go out there and look at what's happening in the marketplace and hear through all of these different perspectives. And so, you know, I interviewed 70 people over the course of last year to come up with, this is what I think is the, the right approach to marketing. So I found investors and advisors and angels and big VCs and marketers and CEOs and serial CEOs and people that are household names with companies and brands like Marketo or Adobe or little companies that you've never heard of and may never hear of, but they're doing something really amazing and really interesting of their own right. And it led me down all these different paths and it changed me as a selfishly, it changed me as a marketer. I'm a much better marketer today because I've had these 70 conversations and that's all woven into the book. So yeah, thank you for, for recognizing the research. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think when you initially were talking about it um, months and months ago before it was released, that was really the, you know, the interesting process is this really isn't, the book is an extension. It feels like a, um, you know, a manual to sort of the greater uh, conversations you've had. You've, you've got a great podcast and so on, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll tee that up at the end to, to share with folks where they can listen to, to that a bit. But I want to dive in specifically to a section at the beginning of your book where you talked about marketing being critical to the success uh, of the, the, these businesses for these founders. And, um, that oftentimes you found them to be hesitant about the, the role that marketing plays and whether it's, it's indeed critical or it's just sort of something that possibly gets in the way or, uh, um, you know, is, 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 is is not going to help their beautiful baby be more successful because their baby is of course talented and good looking and charming and, and, and all those sorts of things. Um, and so someone that runs a marketing agency, I can definitely agree uh, that, that founders can often, and not even founders many times, but most of the time it ends up being founders that are really hesitant about the role that marketing plays. And they've got a number of different reasons why uh, for, for that hesitancy, in your book, you talk about, you know, prior bad experiences, which is something we run into an, an awful lot. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that for all the years of, of your marketing uh, experience as well, you've, you've run into where somebody gets burned by whether it be an agency or somebody else in a particular role, mm -hmm. um, uh, lack of lack of understanding. Um, maybe it's even stuff just within their their product itself that there's the the uh, the product is like we were just saying, going to be that beautiful, charming baby that's going to need no help because it's blessed by the gods to to succeed. <laughs> um, but 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 I wanted to I wanted to dive into a couple here, um, and uh, one where I think lies a bit in in the responsibility of marketers and and what uh, and their sort of side of, of the equation, and then and another where I believe it really um, is, is the founder. Um, the, you talk about communication issues and one of uh, the way that you explain it is, you know, we're using a lot of jargon and, and, and acronyms and terminology and things all the time. And, and uh, in the way that we explain marketing um, and, and in a, in a, in a discipline and a profession where we're sort of priding ourselves on trying to communicate more as human in a more human way, uh, we're, we're awfully guilty of using a lot of terminology across the board, not just within, you know, uh, the space with our peers, but also with some of the other folks that we're communicating with. Uh, what, what's, uh, can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Well, and, and I'll take a, a little bit of a step back because I think you framed this really well. And it's, I think it's critical to the conversation and why I think there's such discord between, uh, 
founders, entrepreneurs, we'll just say business leaders, not even founders, right? Let's put ourselves in the shoes of anybody that's a CEO that's running a company of any size, shape or form and the frustration they have with marketing. I think it is part of it is marketing's fault and part of it is leadership's fault. And there's issues on both sides. And the way I'm really looking at this is it's like marriage counseling, right? Where it really comes down to, it's not anyone's person's fault. And even if you're screaming and pointing your finger at the other person, there's always something from the other side that's causing driving some of the behavior. And so part of what we're trying to do with this book in particular is help founders understand the point of view of marketers and help marketers understand the point of view of the leader and the founder and help those two sides come together. So marketing for our part, I think one of the things that we do that's particularly struggling for a founder is we use inside baseball, we use jargon, and we use terms that we don't fully explain to them or help them understand. And we don't give them the fuller vision or align ourselves to their vision. We tend to come in and go, this is my playbook. This is the thing that I've done. Here's how I'm going to talk about MQLs and SQLs. And the founder sitting there going, I don't know what an MQL or an SQL is, and I'm not going to ask that question. And it may be simple at that when you go, well, yeah, I know that's a sales qualified lead. And I know that's a marketing qualified lead. But you can drive a truck through the differences of what those things mean at each given place. I can go to three different companies and come up with five different answers for what an MQL and an SQL really is. Yep. And so because we haven't standardized in a way that's universal, because we don't use terms that are universal, because we don't describe this and think about this in the same way, and because we don't sit down and really at times work with a founder to understand what it is that that person, that leader is ultimately trying to accomplish at this stage of the game and what are they really looking for and what's important. And so here's a good example. You, know, you walk into a company and they're like, okay, I need leads. And so as a marketer, you may come in and go, great, I'm going to give you leads. But what marketing may not be doing is going, why do you think you need leads? Where's that idea coming from? Who's driving that? Why do you think you need leads at this particular point in time? What kind of leads do you need? What's our goal that helps drive the decision about leads? And once you start unpacking that and start having that conversation, you may realize that it's just a person that they had coffee with that was the last bit of information in that said, you need more leads. And they were like, I need more leads. And it sometimes is literally that simple. Other times it's, they've got a sense of where they're trying to take the business and they haven't articulated it to you because you haven't pulled it out of them. And so I think marketers owe it to ourselves to come in and really understand the framework, the groundwork that's being laid. What are the goals that we're really trying to accomplish? And then how do we articulate that back to them with a minimum use of jargon and three letter acronyms to try and find a way to find common ground and commonality. And that may sound somewhat simplistic and it may be sort of a well duh moment, but Reality is I see this play in over and over and over again here in Silicon Valley and certainly in other places around the country and around the, around the world where this disconnect happens because you're just not speaking the same language. And that becomes frustrating for both sides because you're just not seeing eye to eye. You're in different places completely. You know, you, you mentioned, I mean, the whole crux of this was communication being an issue and, and also that sort of like, duh, this should be pretty straightforward to, to, to recognize, but I, I've been finding, especially over the last couple of years with a, a number of discussions we've had with um, not only founders, but just the, the discussions between helping our clients be, uh, that, that are having discussions with their sales teams, the level of, of um, the, the importance of communication in that, that, um, that play. There's, there's folks that are just not asking uh, the right questions you, you were talking about sort of peeling it back a little bit more and going to what is, what is, what's the objective that you have here? What is the reason why we want to do this? It, we've run into instances where just the word conversion in the same vein as what you said, yeah. the word lead ends up being used in all these products in very different ways. Cause it's sometimes is product centric and then sometimes is strategy, you know, centric or whatever. And, um, and so we'd be having a conversation and somebody, somebody has to stop and say, so what are we talking about when we say conversions? Because we're, we're, we're using the language interchangeably often. And it, it's a good reminder sometimes of like slowing down and just asking questions in a way to help make sure that everybody's on the same page and, 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 and that you're using uh, the, the right language and being mindful about how you're communicating with those folks. Well, and, and one of the things we talk about in the book and we break it down, we break these sort of 
the growth of a company into five stages and we make it very simplistic intentionally. And it, you know, it's, it's hard to take complex ideas and make them simple. And what we tried really hard to do with the book and I've tried really hard to do with my consultancy and as I talk to companies is to really try and take this com complex idea and make it really simple. Here's where you are as a company at this stage in time. Here are the things that you're trying to do. You're trying to find product market fit, or you're trying to test and see what works in the marketplace, or you're trying to find your first customer, you're trying to find that, that first perfect customer and what that profile looks like. Or, hey, you know what? It's, it's guns a-blazing, full speed ahead. We've got a product, we found our market, we know how to message to them, and now we're just gonna throw a lot of money at the process and we're gonna go and grow. And wherever you are in that process, it's, it's identifying where you are and then having this common discussion with marketing to say, here's where we are and here's what we need. And here's what I found as a quick example is, you may be in a testing phase where you're like, I know what my product is, I have an idea where my customer is, now I've got to find ways to connect to them. And the complexities there are, you don't know what time of day to connect to them, you don't know what platform they're on, <clears throat> you don't know what message to use, you don't know what resonates with them, how many times do you have to talk to them, are they on at three o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon? Are they on Facebook? Would they rather have a video? Do they need to see that 10 times? All of those things need to be addressed before you can really go in and, and go full speed ahead. But the founder may be looking at this and be like, hey, look, we've got our product figured out and I know my customer looks like Adam, so go find me 200,000 Adams. And, and then there's this disconnect of, wait a minute, we've got to test this stuff, but if I go full speed ahead and I put all this money behind it, you're not gonna get the results that you're looking for. There's a great quote by Lauren Vaccarello who uh, runs customer acquisition and she's just so smart about thinking about how to acquire and connect with your customer. And she said, look, if you want a thousand leads, I can give you a thousand leads. Give me a thousand iPads, I'll go to a Giants game and I'll get a lead for every iPad and you'll get a thousand leads, but your revenue will be zero. So what do you really focus on and what are you trying to do? And again, we're coming back to this, making sure that there's this connection of what marketing wants to do, what leadership wants to do, and making sure that they're aligned and on the same page and that they understand it. But that disconnect keeps happening over and over and over again. So let's go beyond communication a bit and, and talk about one of the other reasons for that resistance uh, that you put in your book, which is that founders believe that it can happen later, that that there's a product that they have, that's what they need to focus on. And then once they're all said and done, they can, they can go to marketing, just like you said, or they can hire somebody by that, you know, look for somebody to yeah. hire at that time, which I've seen happen before, and then go ahead and say, great, here you go. My baby's here. Now go, uh, go shop them around, get them into some <laughs> modeling contests and get them some gigs and some commercials and, and this, and that sort of thing. So yeah. you, you specifically say in the book, the two product and marketing go hand in hand. One should not exist without the other. Why, why do you feel folks are running into that predicament? Well, this is good because we spent the first part of the show blaming marketing. Yeah, so yeah. now let's go get the founders. Exactly. Let's get them. Let's get them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, look, I think this is one of those, one of the things I found and one of the reasons why this is focused on founders, but it, it's really anyone that has an, I mean, I, I hate to get all new age here, but anyone has an emotional investment in the company or the product. The belief then becomes, I invented this, or I'm really passionate about this. Therefore, everyone should have that same emotional attachment. Everyone should have that same passion that I have. And so what ends up happening is, there's this sort of belief of like, hey, I've created this really amazing thing, and therefore everybody should love it, and therefore people should be beating a path to my door. And it's this idea, if I build it, they will come. And part of what we talk about in the book is, if you build it, they will not come. You may try and, you may find them and you may connect to them and you may draw them to you, but they're not going to come naturally. And look, I wrote, a, I wrote a book on this. I know better, right? I help people through this process. But I'll tell you, I fell into the same thing. I started my podcast and I'm, I'm happy to talk about this because it's, it's delightfully embarrassing. I started my podcast. Let's go for it. Delightfully embarrassing. Awesome. Delightfully embarrassing, right? I started my podcast and I'm like, this podcast is amazing. I've got all these great recorded interviews, all these people in the book, these luminaries from Silicon Valley. This thing is going to be great. And so I launched my first 10 and I sat there and I pressed refresh over and over and over again, <laughs> waiting, waiting for the, the, the like tidal wave of people that were going to come into my podcast. Yep, yep. And after a couple of days, I was like, you know what? I fell into the same trap because 
I think it's amazing and therefore I put it out there and I assume that people are going to come running. And so I think founders, founders, entrepreneurs, big dreamers, they all sort of feel the same thing. Of, I'm doing something really great. This is a problem that I'm solving. And so the belief is if I just create a really great product, I don't need marketing because the reason marketing exists is in their minds to go get a customer to come find you that they wouldn't find you anyway. Marketing's just trying to open a path and bring people in. They're like barkers on the street, you know, yeah. come in, eat at Joe's, right? And, and what they believe is, well, that's just going to happen naturally. And what we're finding is, look, there's so much noise out in the marketplace. We're bombarded constantly with content and information. Trying to break through that, even if you've got the most amazing product, means that you have to market it, present it, and pitch it in the right way. And even if that doesn't happen, you still need to think about, look, as a founder, you need money. You need, unless you're self-funding this thing out of your own pocket, which very, very few of them are, you need money. And so part of your marketing is the first pitch and finding investors and finding seed round. Part of your marketing is finding advisors and people within your network that are going to support you and be that formal or informal group of advisors. Part of your marketing is finding out exactly what's that first customer profile. Who's the person you're trying to find in the marketplace and what do they look like? How do you find that first customer? How do I bring on amazing people to be excited about this product and help build it from an engineering or product perspective? How do I go out and actually land that first customer, get them installed, get them up and running and make them successful? How do I repeat that five more times? How do I start to scale that business? How do I start to go to market and find out what my specific geography is and what my price points are? All of those things are marketing. But if you think of marketing as that end mile of like, I just need leads or marketing is the thing that I do when I want to start driving customers to my website. Well, then you've missed the entire point of marketing. All of those things that I've just described are marketing. And so marketing has to happen at the very earliest stages. And one other quick point on this, that doesn't mean that I'm saying you should hire a CMO as your second person because that's the wrong approach as well. We see that mistake happen often too. It just means don't denigrate the role of marketing by thinking marketing is just this thing that happens at the very end. You're marketing at the very beginning. You're just acting as the CMO yourself, as the founder, the CEO, and the CMO to go build all these things. But you are marketing. And then fundamentally, you're going to bring somebody on to help you with that. And then you're going to build a team. And then you're going to find a leader to do that that can be your right hand, your left hand, your second hand, whatever that term is. And then you can go and build an entire marketing organization that becomes a part of who and what you are. But that's still marketing, even if you don't understand what that is all the way through. Yeah, when you were starting to, to, to add that uh, last part of, uh, part of that, um, what I was starting to hear and, and I've recognized is, is a disconnect between people's understanding of what marketing is. There are, there are a lot of, there are a lot of elements to it, but exactly what you were saying, like being able to, it's, it's one thing to think that this idea is great, but is it marketable? And is it something yeah. that as you can, is there a market for it? You know, these are the types of questions that initially in the inception of, of, of a, of an idea or a business, you, you, you're going to be thinking about it, but sure there's a process as it develops out there. But in the end, those are things that should always be, um, running parallel to the product development and to, um, like you said, the pitching, you're, you're essentially selling and marketing to the folks that you're hiring to the, the folks that you hope are going to fund the thing. Um, yeah. uh, the, the partner that you hope to bring in some of the executives you, you hope to bring in, in in the future. And if you're able to, um, to wrap your head around that mindset, you have, and I, I think again, like you said, recognize that as really truly, um, a lot of things, but marketing included, uh, then, then you will, there'll be a, a different level of, it's not about respecting marketing. It's just about understanding the, the role that marketing actually fundamentally plays and, and not just sort of a bolt on function that, uh, is just, a checking off the list at the end. Once the thing is ready to, to, to scream to the crowds, we're here, come by us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I heard from, I heard from a lot of founders in the process that, um, They'd say, well, once, once I get my C round, we're, we'll do marketing. And it's like, well, wow. okay, you know, no, because actually you've been doing marketing since you inception. You've been doing marketing through angel and through A and through B. You're thinking of marketing the wrong way. 
And so part of it's communication, part of it's understanding marketing, but some of it's just understanding that, look, really good marketing, the, the articulation of the value that your product service brings to the marketplace goes into your, your finances, it goes into your customer's connection, it co- goes into deciding what geographies, places, et cetera, you go, but it goes into hiring really great people. If you can fundamentally articulate the value and do that at scale so that you as a CEO aren't having to go hire every single person you bring into the company, because the only reason they're joining is because you, Adam, they love you and they love what you have to say. Well, you can do that for the first 10 people, but you can't do it for the next 20 because you can have business you've got to run. So part of it has to be, how do I do this at proxy? How do I get people to have the same excitement that I have for the business that I've created and be able to do this in a way that I can go find and hire these great people? Now, you can call that talent management, you can call it HR, but I tend to look at it as marketing. It's the articulation and the value of the company, and I'm getting people excited about that, and they become my customers, they become my advisors, they become my partners, they become my financiers, and they also become my employees. And so think about marketing in that lens, and all of a sudden, marketing takes on new value. It's not about respect, and it's not about marketing deserves a better place, It's that you understand what marketing does for an organization, and now marketing has new light. So now you start to think about what do I do and how do I do this across my growth? When do I bring a marketer on? Am I bringing John, the the every person marketer, as this early person to come in and do a bunch of things for me? Am I hiring an agency? Am I looking at consultants? Do I need people to do just specific things? Does everyone roll up their sleeves and kind of do it? I've seen it, all those models work and they work really well, but it's because you've got a perfect, you've got a, an articulation of what you're trying to do, you know, where you are in the space, you know, what you're trying to accomplish and you know the kind of talent that you need to help you go do that. Where it fails is where you hire a CMO because that's what you think you need to do and you're, you don't have any employees yet and then you've got a CMO that you're spending a lot of money on and is sitting around going, but I can't do anything because I don't have people to help me do this. Or you go the other way and you hire a bunch of people and you don't have a leader and they're just, they're just engaging with whatever you tell them to do. And it's probably not the right thing. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, it boils down to understanding what is the objective of marketing at this current stage in your business, right? At the, just as you described it, there's a, there's a, an evolution or a, or a, you know, a change in marketing, depending on that stage of that company. Absolutely. So how can people continue to learn from the stuff that you're doing from the book, from the research that you got going on? And like you were mentioning earlier, you got a consultancy and everything, but you're, you're putting out a podcast. How can they find out more and and stay uh, abreast of what you're doing? Well, this might be the best question you've asked me all day (laughs) long. I've been waiting for this one. So should have put it at the beginning, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. Gosh, you know, it would have been a lot shorter of a podcast had I done that. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Something like that. So uh, if you, if you've liked what you've heard so far or interested and you've sort of scratched into something, there's a couple places you can go. So the book is called beyond product. It is out in ebook format. You can find it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or your favorite book e-tailer. Um, that came out in February. The paperback version, the physical version of the book comes out on May 7th. And again, you can find those in bookstores, your local bookstores, or certainly online at your Barnes and Nobles and your Amazons, et cetera. Um, the book, just a quick aside, is what I call an airplane read. So you can read it in a five-hour flight between, say, coast to coast. Um, it's not meant to be all things to all people, but it's meant to be enough to get you the right information and to get you going on your way. And then as people want more information, the place to go is foundersplace.co. That's foundersplace.co. You can listen to the podcast. The 70 people that were interviewed for the book are on there. My blogs, insight, et cetera. And I try and keep this thing up to date. And then if you want to, you can follow me on any of the major platforms, uh, it's Todd Wilms or Todd M. Wilms with the M in the middle. And it's on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, dot, 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 and on down the line. You, you, you have a list next to you? You had that, you had that like down pat. You had uh, all those. <laughs> <laughs> I've, done, I've done that a, a couple of times. But really, foundersplace.co is the all one word is the best place to go find all of that. That's sort of the launch pad for book where I'm speaking, the podcasts. 
the thing I'll say, I, I've really, I've loved the podcasting aspect of it. I've always been a blogger, a, a short form person. Uh, I like the written word, but there's something really nice about having a dialogue, a conversation with somebody and being able to scratch into some really deep topics that you can do on a podcast that you can't normally do on some of these other platforms. And so the podcasts have been both rewarding, but also an opportunity to, hey, you want to talk to somebody who's an investor and they're going to tell you about the 10 things that they're looking for to invest in your company. And it's not about the pitch deck, it's about other things. That's a great podcast. Or you want to talk to a person who wrote the book on leadership with General Stanley McChrystal and is a New York Times bestselling author. That's awesome. Or you want to hear about networking, go in and, and listen to Karen Wickery. So there's a bunch of really great conversations in there that the book touches on, but you go deep on those on the podcast. Well, I got to say, um, and I, I think I've said this before, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really, uh, proud of the, of the book that you, that you wrote. Um, I, I think the, uh, the, the concept is, is really great. Um, and I think that the way you broke it down is, is really awesome. We, I've said that in the, the moment you told us about the, 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 the concept and that your podcast that you did, did inspire me to finally relaunch a podcast, which is what we're doing right here. And so I, I appreciate you being a part of, you know, one of the first episodes here as I sort of figure out, uh, how I'm going to be, you know, continuing producing the episodes and what the, the, the jive is going to be there. So thanks for, for being a part of that, Todd. Well, Hey, I really appreciate it. And thank you for the kind words at the end. I mean, look, I, I think we all want our own personal success, but part of what I get so jazzed about is when I can inspire somebody else, whether I'm intending to or not, and feel like whatever goodness I've got goes out to someone else. And again, I'm sounding very new agey. I've got to take a look at that. I think I've been in California too long. He's saying but, it as he's holding up crystals in uh, in the video <laughs> chat. <laughs> no, no, he's not. In. <laughs> no, I've, I've put my crystals away, man. Um, <laughs> But no, I really, I really appreciate the kind words and I'm, and I'm glad that, uh, that this could be a jumping off point for you as well. So thanks for having me on the conversation today and, and uh, I really enjoyed it and it's been an absolutely fantastic time for me. Woohoo! You made it to the end of the podcast. Awesome. Well, thank you for spending time with me and the Marketing in the Raw podcast. Uh, again, my name is Adam Helway and uh, I am just going to continue to work hard at getting more and more of these shows out to you. Uh, if you enjoyed what you heard, please subscribe. And if you've already subscribed, you are incredible and I love you. And if you haven't, you should be ashamed of yourself. No, I'm just kidding. I don't want to guilt you into subscribing, but it would be awesome if you would. And uh, if you've already subscribed, then please leave us a review and a rating wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. That helps so many other people find us. And then last but not least, if you'd like to talk about marketing, if you need help with anything you got going on or just simply want to connect, you can go ahead and email me at adam at secretsushi.com uh, or you could just go to secretsushi.com and check out what we're doing. Okay, take care. <music>